All right, guys, welcome back to this episode. Uh, in, this, in this lesson, we're going to be discussing stock suspensions and custodianships. Uh, something lately we've been dealing with is, you know, stocks getting suspended. Um, and we're dealing with a lot of custodianship plays and going into fall or into the trading days. Now, you want to understand that you're not in something bad, especially suspensions. Um, we just experienced with Leho, L-A-H-O, uh, with a stock suspension. Um, and in that suspension, you know, right here clearly says they're delinquent SEC reporting. And I want you guys to be able to understand what SEC delinquent SEC reporting is. And in these suspensions, um, it's a bad situation to be in because you can't sell your shares. You know, you're stuck. Whatever money you bought of shares before this became suspended, it's money lost. It's, it's just money that is stuck in something you can never sell. Um, it's occasionally these things will hit the gray markets um, and then you could sell it for a massive discount because no one trades gray markets. Um, but it, it's, it, it's a terrible situation to be in. It's something I do my best not to give you guys alerts that would get you stuck in this sort of thing. Um, but that's what this lesson is dedicated to is helping you guys find out the reason behind, you know, what could be suspended and what couldn't be suspended and what helps a stock get prevented from suspension. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. The SEC just suspended my stock, now what? It happens to almost all penny players. One morning you wake up, grab some coffee, start checking your stocks, especially that very volatile issue that's been running big. Pre-market level two is looking good. If all goes well, perhaps today will be the day to take some profit. And then at 9.30 you see nothing like this. Level two goes blank, your heart sinks. Okay, you're looking at your level two, uh, you know, your bid and your ask, and there's zero, 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 zero. There's, there's, no, there's no, you know, bid to ask spread on there. When you see that, it's immediate realization that the stock has been suspended. And I've never had experience where stocks got suspended uh, during the day. It's always the next day. Okay, let's say something ran outlandish on a delinquent SEC delinquent the previous day. And the next day, you think this play is, you know, it's on iHub breakout boards or something. It's just got massive potential and everybody's claiming this and claiming that without thoroughly checking the due diligence of its filings. And, you know, the next day you're ready to crash that, you know, cash in that sell order and, and go big on it because it's going to continue today. And, you know, you see that level two go blank the next day. Um, it's suspended. Your heart sinks. If you've had this experience before, you know you go to the SEC website where your fears are confirmed. Um, I mean, you, can, you go to the SEC website, it shows all their suspensions every day, um, and, and it's a terrible feeling. Um, I've got one currently that I'm stuck in as well. Um, so it's not something that doesn't ever happen to anybody. It's always going to happen to someone eventually. You just got to minimize that. Trading has been suspended. If you're new to the penny arena, you may not have any idea what's going on. So instead, you go to a message board and try to figure things out. There you'll probably read conflicting opinions. Some will even be a reassuring pay no attention. Trading suspensions are a very bad thing. You need to understand what has occurred and what will occur. SEC tr trading suspensions. Suspensions are not to be confused with exchange halts. They are different actions with different causes and outcomes. Suspensions are the end of the road for most targeted stocks. Exchange halts can be survived and in some cases are positive. The SEC offers an explanation here and here. Okay, I've got a link here. The SEC suspends trading any stock for two basic reasons. The company is a delinquent fi filer or fraud is suspected. Now, like I said, you go to when you you got a stock and you want to look for it to see if it's, you know, a delinquent filer, most times this little link right here is gonna pop up on OTC markets, okay? Company is not currently reporting its obligations under section 13 or 15D of the Exchange Act. So it's a delinquent SEC reporting. Now you go to other stocks like PFMS right now, you know, it's not current on its filings yet, but it's dark defunct. It's not an SEC delinquent. Uh, you go to disclosure filings, and this little bugger right here, this little 15, bit form 15 protects the investor from ever being a delinquent or under SEC suspension. You know, we'll click it here. We're going to pull it up. 
This is a certification notice of the termination of registration under Section 12 of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or suspension of duty to file reports under Section 13 of the Security Exchange Act of 1934. So this is telling the SEC, leave me alone. I know I'm not current on my filings. You have no reason to suspend me. It protects me. I'm withdrawing my position to do anything to do with SEC. Give me time. I'm going to be reporting some filings. Okay. This is pretty much what's telling the SEC. It's kind of a uh, flip off bird, you know, giving the bird to the SEC that they can't do anything. And it protects the shell uh, from getting suspended. And, you know, David Lazar put this out on PFMS, just an example. But, uh, you know, that was the very first filing he did because it was very prone to get suspended beforehand, okay? You see from 2008, 2009, 2010, that's the last, that's the last filings this company has ever reported. So it's a dead, dark, defunct shell that had SEC delinquent up here as well. And without it, that Form 15 took off that SEC delinquent and it saves the shell from ever being suspended. Now they can report filings directly to OTC markets and they will be posting up here and they won't have to post a single filing through SEC afterwards. You know, they're pretty much just letting SEC know that they're late on their filing. Sometimes they will continue to keep posting through SEC, but they also have the option to be able to freely post through OTC markets instead. Delinquent filers are SEC registered companies that have failed to submit required annual and quarterly financial reports. The 10Q or the 10K, 10Q is quarterly filings and the 10K is an annual filing one, once a year. Usually the agency sends delinquency notices before taking action. If they are ignored, trading in the company stock may be suspended without notice. Okay, you've got zero notice that it's going to be suspended. Okay, that's what's the bad part about SEC. They could give two shits about your money in this play. And it leaves shareholders stuck with thousands of dollars. I mean, some people will put their full account in one play and it's as dangerous as it gets, especially in something that's delinquent. Um, so something to keep in mind. At the same time, the SEC will initiate administrative proceedings to revoke the registration. The company will be served with a letter informing it has up to 10 days in which to make some kind of case for its failure to file. If it does not do so, registrations will be revoked by default, okay? They give 10 days, okay? Before suspension happens, the company receives 10 days uh, before they will actually suspend it. But that company never will let its shareholders know that it's under suspension, um, you know, possibly SEC suspension because they're obviously dead. They don't care. There's nothing company related to them. They could give two shits about it. And then, bam, SEC will revoke, uh, will, registration will be revoked by default and suspend the stock. So in the case of Leho, that means they received a letter 10 days ago before Friday getting suspended. And, of course, us as shareholders don't know that knowledge because the company on the other side would know it ahead of time. That kind of goes to show you that Leho was dead and was nothing to it. It was nothing but a pump being pushed forward. And a lot of these groups will pump these plays and pump, 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 all because they see some kind of due diligence that they're trying to force on you. And of course they need money to push this play. And it could be um, note holders with conversions. They need to convert uh, as far as dilution, so to speak, they've got notes. They want you to help pay off um, that they want to sell to the market. Uh, it could be a matter of all kinds of things, just a pump, just to make, you know, play go up and make a bunch of money from it from preloaders in the beginning. What the company does only matters if it hopes to resume trading one day. Several recent cases suggest the SEC is now recommending the issues who want to make things right, should accept revocation, and then get two years of audited filings in order and file a new Form 10. That has the advantage of revealing the company from the obligation to catch up with dozens of old financial reports, which might prove an impossible task but it has the disadvantages of leaving shareholders in the lurch for as long as it takes to get the filings in, find a sponsoring market maker and get a form 211 approved by FINRA. The company may have problems raising money in the Ethereum as well. When he is sure that choose his path with superior oil and gas, SIOR, which was suspended on January 25th, January 2013. Though it initially announced the process could be completed quickly, to date it has filed no form 10 and has ceased public communication with its investors. 
Okay. It's literally a very daunting, almost impossible task to um, please the SEC in a such that will allow them to get that suspension released. Okay. It's just not like a typical stock halt where it's just kind of halted for the period until you, you know, report something. It's suspended. It's literally like deleting the company from the marketplace. Once registration has been revoked, the stock's ticker will be deleted. Shareholders will still be shareholders, but any private company. Their stock will be extremely liquid and its value will be difficult to determine as there is no permanent, no public market maker. So this is a sense where things kind of go to a gray market. The vast majority of suspended stocks are those of the delinquent filers. Suspensions, orders for suspected violations of the securities laws are more interesting than those ordered for delinquency. Many del delinquent filers are entirely dead companies Often without any corporate existence, companies suspended for suspected fraud have usually been quite active in the recent past and perhaps are currently active. The three most recent suspensions for cause brought by the agency were of Polar Petroleum Corp, P-O-R, P-O-L-R, BioZoom, B-I-Z-M, and Nostra Energy, N-O-R-X, all of which have been trading vigorously just before the SEC brought down the hammer. An explanation of the action is offered in the form of suspension notes that appears to the SEC website on a dedicated page. The explanations are unfortunately rather vague. They're usually phrased in the form of question about things like possibly misleading press releases or other public statements, the company's operations and business arrangements like mergers and acquisitions or buyouts. Sketchy as the information provided is, it at least suggests to observers what the agency is looking at. With the BIZM suspension, the reasons were made a bit clear. The SEC decided on the action because of concern that certain BioZoom affiliates and shareholders may have unjustly relied upon Rule 144 of the Securities Act of 1933. And they, BioZoom and others, may be engaged in unlawful distribution of securities through the OTCBB. That is very clear and makes perfect sense given that BIZM is still considered to be a shell company under SEC regulations. BIZM made a fatal error and will not recover. <clears throat> the suspension notice also informs market makers that the company has lost compliance with Rule 15C211, and so they may no longer make a market in the security or publish quotations, okay? So in order for these companies to continue, they have to have sponsoring market makers, and you're trading OTC, over-the-counter stocks, okay? These stocks are, you know, literally the trash of the trash we're, we're trading. So in order for these companies, they will, you know, these rules will not allow market makers to make a market for them. So there's zero bid, there's zero ask. They're not going to be able to fulfill orders. It's a suspended stock. Um, so it's a huge asset to try to get market makers that sponsor this stock uh, in order to be continued. In addition, it sets a time for the expiration of the suspension. The later is there irrevertibly 11.59 p.m. on the 10th trading day following the announcement of the action, okay? That's why you see at 11.59, okay, it's way late past the, the day. And what do you know, like Leho, the next day it's suspended, okay? They've got the 10th day up to the 10th trading day, 11.59 p.m. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Of the 10th trading day following the announcement of the action. Once upon a time, the SEC was allowed to impose successive suspensions, but an issuer sued in a federal rule Rule, judge ruled against the agency. Now it can only be suspended for a second time if it can find a different reason to do so. During the suspension, the stock will be delisted to the gray markets as a result of its non-compliance with SEC Rule 15C to 11. Usually that happens a day or two after the action is taken. Shareholders can see the change on OTC markets. As noted above, that means the MMs won't be able to publish quotations or make a market. They can facilitate trades for brokers, but they are not obligate, obliged to fill any orders they may receive. Trades will be matched through several smaller orders may be set off against a single larger one. Okay, what happens next? You get that convent emptor, okay? As you see here with Leho. They get slapped with that convent emptor, okay? Buyer beware, this is a public interest concern associated with the company. Okay, it's a skeleton, skull, skull bones. It's, it's literally saying that this, this play is <laughs> locked. It's, it's delinquent. It's, just, it's literally way worse than stop sign, okay? 
And, you know, you see other planes that have the stop sign play, uh, which we play all the time because there's a, there's a whole, uh, a whole process of filings that come after making good catalysts for these plays. Uh, but the skull and crossbones, that's a massive big no, no Cavet emptor or CE as we call it short. Uh, often hopeful shareholders caught any suspension tell each other that trading may resume before the 10 days have ended. That never happens. Sometimes they convince themselves that it was just a mistake on the part of the SC. It was not. The agency is aware that suspensions are a death sentence and does not invoke them lightly. Angry investors may rail against shorty and bashers, but the truth is that although the SEC may have originally received tips about problems with the company, they always conduct their own investigation before taking any action. Some companies issue a press release immediately, is usually saying they are corporately fully cooperating fully with the SEC and hoping to resolve the problem quickly. Others say nothing at all or make an announcement when trading resumes. Either way, there is no quick, re quick resolution. Most of the time, there's resolution at all. The SEC will not comment but warn shareholders that an investigation may be ongoing. In order to resume trading normally on the pinks or OTC markets, OTC QB tier, the company must find a market maker willing to file that form 211 to enable and regain compliance with the rule 15C 211. The form looks simple enough, but it's not. And there's a special section asking whether the issue has been subject to a trading suspension. When an MN files the 211, it assumes liability. For the reason, they are not generally willing to sponsor a company that's been suspended unless they have very good reason to believe the SEC will not be bringing a further enforcement action, okay? They, these market makers don't want to be market makers for a gray market stock because they're liable for everything on it. It's, a, it's, it's not a good thing for them, so why mess with it? Usually the agency is unwilling to offer such guarantees and so the stock is left in limbo. There is a case in which a formerly suspended stock did manage to claw its way back to the pinks. The issuer was Emirate Health Corporation, EMGE, which explained any management discussion analysis what had happened. It was suspended in September of 2009 because of a pump and dump campaign or promotion. Management assured the SEC that it played no role in the promotion. Evidently, they were believed. The SEC sued the perps and in two, July 2010 sent a letter to EMGA's attorney indicating they would not be recommending any further action against the company. In August 2010, a broker-dealer filed a Form 211 to sponsor them. Several rounds of comments from FINRA ensued. The company finally returned to the pinks in early 2011. Now think about that. It was suspended in 2009, and it finally became uh, – late 2009. It finally became a return to the pinks to be tradable in early 2011. Okay, you've got, what, two years of waiting in suspense while your shares are locked up in this company. And that was, this is the only case I know of that this has happened. It's so rare to ever have a stock be, you know, unsuspended and back to pinks on OTC markets, but it does happen, but it's so super rare. Like I said, it took two years for this process to take place. Unfortunately, its efforts were a little too late. It currently trades at around six, six cents and it's completely dark now. Um, so pretty much when it opened up, everybody sold their stash. Uh, the company gave up on the shareholders because it crashed. Uh, this, tra this, this play was up a lot, apparently, and it crashed back down to a two six cents uh, price point. When trading resumes, once the suspension expires, a formerly suspended stock will reopen on the gray markets. In most cases, it will trade on the first day. The issues that were illiquid before the action may not. In our initial scenario, I described a hot penny that had attracted a good deal of attention that resulted in heavy buying, the kind that would see interest right away. Its first day on the grades, grades will not be heartening for anyone holding. Normally, the first trade will be executed shortly after bail and will be a low ball, very low. It may take the stock down as much as 80%. Very likely that the person who ventures that initial trade has entered a market order. Don't be that guy. Wait to see what happens in the next couple of hours. Usually the price will tick up a little, but you still have a problem. You're trading blind, okay? There's no level two uh, bid or ask. You don't know what's out there. There's no level two, no bid or ask. You need to decide what offer you think will be accepted. You'll be able to, to see executed trades as they happen, and they will give you an idea of what range you should try for. Trading is likely to be extremely volatile, but by the end of the session, price will sharply be sharply down, a loss between 60 to 80% is common, okay? Just to recoup whatever kind of money you can pull out of a gray market ticker, okay? 
Um, yes, it's, it's disheartening to lose all that money, but at least you're going to get something. Okay. You just, just 20%, 40% of what capital that you have in there. Um, let's say you got $10,000 in there, which I sure hope you guys don't. Um, you know, you might be left with 2000, you might be left with $3,000 after you sell. Um, but don't market sell. You never want to hit a market sell. You want to see what sell orders are kind of going through on the, uh, you know, the times and sales book. Um, so you probably want to put a limit order, um, you know, kind of in what they're kind of executing. You don't want to be a cheap ass because, uh, or you don't want to be a greedy ass thinking, oh, well, someone's going to buy my shares here at the very top. No, they don't want your stock. They want nothing to do with your play. Um, you've got to take that loss and get out if you want to, you know, kind of recoup anything if your stock does hit the gray market after suspension. Um, you have no rights to say that you want a high dollar for your play and it's worth whatever you think it's worth. It's worth nothing. After the SEC suspension, all the DD, all the company, all the whatevers that you find on Twitter pumping this or pumping that is all out the window, okay? Think of your play as... Um, well, how, what's the worst thing you can think of about your play <laughs> that it's literally getting flushed down the toilet and you better take your shares and run or you take your, take your dollars and run, uh, at the best possible price you can possibly sell, which is like I said, 60 to 80% less than what it currently is at. When a very active stock is suspended, MMs are trapped along with the traders. Okay. Market makers have their shares in as well when they is suspended. So they're, they've trapped along with traders and they've been selling naked too. Pro, provide liquidity, they may be left with open short positions. They'll want to cover as soon as trading resumes and therefore will be buyers. Do not, however, imagine that those short positions will be gigantic. They'll only provide a brief window in which volume will be high, so time your exits accordingly. Like I said, be prepared for 60, 80% loss on your shares, okay? But those market makers got to cover their naked short positions. So that means in order to do that, they have to buy whatever shares are selling, okay? That's what helps these in a, in, in a sense, um, but they have to do that. And, you know, once that's taken care of themselves, they tend to lose interest. So once they have taken care of themselves, they tend to lose interest. So during that little brief of volume after open is your best chance of getting out and surviving any capital that you can regain from it. The stock may rise a little in the week or so following its debut on the grades, but as if it does so, volume will decline, making feels more difficult. It's best not to wait too long and lose your chance of recovering some of your investment. After weeks or perhaps a few months, price will plateau for a while as volume continues to drop. In the end, liquidity will dry up entirely and the issue will trade only now and then. Price will drift down slowly. As it goes by, it's possible that the SEC will finally bring closure in the form of litigation for fraud. And especially outrageous cases, the Department of Justice may join in with a criminal prosecution. It can take as long as two years or more for that to happen. Do not believe anyone who claims that if there's no further action six months after the suspension, somehow all is well. In most cases, suspensions for cause don't result in SEC civil lawsuits, much less DOG prosecutions. The SEC appears to believe that much of the suspension the time suspension alone is enough punishment. Often the people behind the suspected fraud are offshore and out of reach. If the SEC can't collect, it makes no sense for them to carry on. They will then be then archived their objective, which is to stop the fraud that provoked the suspension in the first place. If the company is an SEC filer, it will probably stop filing after the suspension. Reporting to Edgar is costly and is pointless for an issue stuck in grays. After a couple years of delinquency, the SEC may decide to put an end of the story altogether and will we'll move the revoke registration that will move will not be challenged. If you're heavily invested, an SEC suspension is an unforgettable nightmare. If you stock you're playing is heavily promoted or as those nasty bashers have raised serious questions about filings, press releases, other communications from the company, take profits early and often. Ignore red flags could cost you dearly if a suspension is invoked. There are no good outcomes for a suspended stock. Only day trade SEC delinquent stocks, okay? I do trade the SEC delinquent stocks rather often, but I only day trade them, okay? I buy and sell the very same day. I never, ever, ever hold 
overnight, okay? If I'm gonna swing dark defunct plays, it's per perfectly fine as long as they have that form 15 in their filing. It's kind of like what PFMS, you know, I, I'll hold that thing all, like, all day long uh, because yes, it's delinquent on its SEC filings, but as I said before, this form 15 protects it right here, okay? That form 15 will not allow it to get suspended. And here's the examples as well. As I said, no up-to-date 10Q or 10K filings, okay? These are all late from 2008, 2009, 2010. There's nothing of financial up-to-date filings for the 10Q or 10K, but that form 15 protects from suspension right here. Um, so, you know, having that is a cushion and it helps make sure you, hold, you check for that file, that form 15 before holding that play overnight. Uh, if you're afraid of a suspension. Leho, just like we did here, you know, it's common stock status is suspended. Delinquent SEC reporting, there are no 10Q filings up to date or 10K filings, okay? The last filings you see here are 17, 2018, 2019, 8Ks. Only thing in 2019 are just 8Ks, okay? They have to report a 10Q every three months, okay? There's no 10Q in 2018 whatsoever, um, the last 10Q was October 31st of 2017. Um, so they're so far behind on their delinquent filings. And the SEC has been cracking down on this a lot this year. Um, I want to say it's close to 100 stocks been uh, SEC suspended this year alone. Um, so, I mean, it's insane. So you've got to watch those filings in order to consider it a long hold. And so many new traders out there don't understand this. Uh, but I've got to preach it to you. I've got to teach it to you. And so you guys can better be prepared. Okay, custodianships. Okay, this is something that we're dealing with a lot is, is custodianships. OTC custodianships, a couple months ago, we saw a couple custodianship plays turn into monster moves. LCTZ and NCHC. LTZZ began to pick up interest in late in the trading session on Monday, February 4th when it filed the annual report at the Nevada Security of State, which is the NVSOS, showing a new officers in control of the shell. The price, the price climbed from 0.097 a share on Monday to a high of 24 cents on Thursday for an overall potential gain of 2,400%, okay? Massive move. All off that catalyst of, you know, they filed that annual report, uh, of the new officer control of the shell. So, you know, the custodian took control of the shell, got granted, and then started dropping those filings, creating that monster move from literally just under a penny to 24 cents, okay? Imagine that kind of gain, 2,400% gain from literally from Monday to Thursday in the same week. Um, you know, those filings are massive. That's kind of what I'm waiting on PFMS. You know, we're, we're in the early stage. It's been granted, um, you know, drop some merger, you know, drop the merger filings of the NVSOS state showing new officers in control of the shell, um, you know, things like that. It's all going to have its catalyst. That's why I love custodianships. And CNHC, another one to get him, began to pick up interest on Tuesday as a sympathy play since both LCTZ and CNHC share the shame custodian. Richard Chang was a custodian of both of these plays. The price, the price climbed from 36 cents a share, uh, 0036 to a high of just over three cents a share with a potential gain of 802%. Massive move, all because his other play uh, dropped filings on it and it kind of in the same sector, being Richard Chang as custodian in this case, uh, to do, to run off of it in, you know, in retaliation to it. This is generally in the spring, okay? This was February. A lot of volume in February and a lot of volume gonna be picking up in fall giving these kinds of runs. Um, a lot more money, people chase it, and people love these certain custodians. Richard Chang, uh, David Lazar, and Joseph Acaro being the two are the three biggest. A third Robert Chang custodianship stock and fusion brand INBI began picking up some interest on Friday, February 8th, pushing it from 0068 to share all the way to two cents a share because of the CNHC and LTZ run. Just because you know he was doing three different custodianship plays they're gonna be expecting you know, similar results for that next custodianship play. Um, so something to keep in mind, always watch the same custodianship plays. You can have a separate watch list uh, of you know, your favorite custodian and on their plays. Those, type, those are the type of gains that all penny stock traders dream about. 
because of doing due diligence, you can have the opportunity to buy the stock under you know, penny and a half a share. We mentioned CNHA as a LCTZ sympathy play since the share, the same custodian. Given the opportunity to buy the stock under 004 share, we first mentioned INB on February 4th before the open at 003 cents a share because of the custodianship petition hitting the court website. Then again on Thursday, February 7th at 005 a share as a potential trade opportunity to follow LCTZ and CNHC. So keeping good eyes on those shells uh, from the same custodian are, are, are nice. They're very nice. I, I keep up with Lazar shells constantly um, and be, you know, to be good plays for the weekend when they get granted, uh, when filings drop on, when they're reinstated. And of course those huge catalysts that we all want officer change and, you know, material definite agreement of a merger. What is a custodian? There are literally thousands of penny stocks that are publicly traded. It isn't uncommon for some of those stocks to get abandoned by their controlled people for a variety of different reasons. When a publicly traded company gets abandoned, it doesn't just stop publicly trading. The abandoned shale would continue to trade until the day that the SEC files an administrative order to revoke the issuer's restriction from SEC filers or until Finner deletes the symbol for a non-SEC filers. That can often mean years of trading as nothing but a zombie ticker. As abandoned shells, the public issuers will fall behind with their business license at the state level since nobody is around to pay the annual fees due to the Secretary of State. When two years pass without an entity paying its business taxes at the state level, the entity becomes revoked. This opens the door for control of the public issuer to be taken over by an interested party, a shareholder or debt holder, for example, through a custodianship petition. I'm going to go zoom this up a little bit. I know it's a little bit harder for some of you guys to read. <clears throat> so in this process, you know, they're, you know, they file a custodian sees an empty shell. It's got a good share structure. The company's fallen behind on, you know, the secretary of state paying the state taxes, business taxes, and keeping up with the filings on the play. So it becomes abandoned and a zombie ticker. Um, so he files a petition through the courts, uh, to become a new custodian of that play. The interest party can file a petition with the local court requesting that the court approve a motion to let the interested party or an individual of their choosing take over control of the abandoned shell in the best interest of the shareholders. The only real concern that court will have is that there is no objections to the motion and that the custodian has a clean background the petitioner has to prove to the court that they have made a legitimate effort to contact the formal control people and have, and they have to convince the court that the custodian is a respectable choice with a clean background that will act in the best interest of the existing shareholders of this zombie ticker, so to speak. That usually isn't hard to do. So most custodianship petitions will be granted by the court. The only exception is usually when the old control people or the old CEO, the old company that used to be in it, uh, do show up back to object if the petitioner voluntarily dismisses the petition. This may happen if the SEC suspends the issuers during the proceedings or initiates an administrative order to revoke trading in the issuer during the proceedings. Legal custodianships versus fraudulent hijackings. The SEC frowns down on the taking over abandoned shells, considering abandoned shells to be ripe for fraud because after they're, ta they're taken over, they are often get used for pump and dump schemes and other sorts of illegal activities, okay? Just say that, you know, you've got this, this group that you follow on Twitter or another chat room, and they're saying, oh, this play is fixing to get custodianship. Um, you know, we're going to grab in cheap and blah, 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 this and blah, 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 that. Gets it pumping, and there's no sign of uh, custodianship filings anywhere. Um, it's pretty much hijacking the zombie ticker to claim it as their own, as a pump and dump strategy. So I said they're ripe for fraud because they know company don't, won't release, uh, you know, different filings or news to say the activity in their stock is, you know, you know, illegal or it's, it's fraudulent, so to speak. So, you know, people will hijack those shells and pump them because uh, they preloaded the hell out of it and they need to sell their shares to you. That's another profit making scheme. Back in 2012, the SEC initiated a program called the Shell Expel to try to combat the problem. Through the Shell Expo program, the SEC suspended trading in over 565 abandoned shells between 2012 and 2015. They were just suspending any of the zombie tickers, period. Okay? 
A huge problem. Of course, if you're stuck in those, it's, you know, you're suspended. The program went cold, though, in 2015, and since that time, custodianship filings have been on the rise. Just the past month alone, there have been over two dozen new custodianship petitions filed. It is important to note here that it is a legal way to take control of an abandoned issue, and there is a fraudulent way. The legal way is filing by a custodianship petition with the court to get approval to become the custodian of the issuer. Um, it's just like, you know, with Lazar, he's filed a court hearing to become, you know, petitioned for his custodianship over an empty shell. The fraudulent way is pretty much any other way people use to take over the control of an abandoned shell or zombie ticker. This could include making fraudulent filings with the local security of state to reinstate the entity, add your name on the name of the others and new officers of the issue without authorization, making a new entity by the same name in the same state or a different state and then filing fraudulent forged documents with the transfer agent showing that you were transferred sole control of the issuer. Another way is making fraudulent filings with the SEC saying you acquired control of the shell. And of course they want to post these documents online and try to show that, you know, such and such is making, you know, this is happening. That is very ripe to become an SEC suspended shell. Uh, something you've got to, you've got to do your background. You've got to check. I mean, you're throwing good money into something that could potentially be bad for your money. Um, so you want to be sure you're throwing good money in something good. The SEC has filed several complaints against individuals for fraudulent hijackings in the past, including David Stalker and Jason Wong, among others. Recently, we have even seen groups using other types of fraud on abandoned shells, like hijacking their old domains to create a fake website and are put out fake press releases, often supported with fake Twitter pages. That's the most common way I've seen shells get hijacked. Um, you know, where these fake you know, your fake Twitter comes out of work and all of a sudden a fake website comes up and it's like, oh man, this, this company's trying to come back, you know, something great is happening here. And of course it's not. Then they put out fake press releases. And as we all know, a play that has a stop sign on it cannot release news without being pink current first. Okay. Latest one right now I know is Paso. Okay. This thing is dropping news like a rock. It's dark defunct. Um, I think it's the biggest scam that's ever hit in OTC right now. Um, I know there's other people playing out, but look at this. They're dropping news. And, well, they're not even posting on OTC markets because it's probably fraud. But anyway, news has been hitting my scanner from other sources. Um, but as you see here, they do have some filings, but the last filings they reported, uh, they do have that 15, you know, so they cannot get suspended. It's easy to hijack this one. Um, but, you know, they're obviously not up to date on their filings, you know, being the last quarterly report on March 27th, still a stop sign play, still dropping news, uh, still pumping the play. So something to keep in mind. The custodianship process, this custodianship process can take several months to complete. Once a custodian petition is filed with the court, the court will set a date for custodianship hearing to take place approximately four to six weeks. In the future, this allows time for the former control people to be served at the last available contact information provided by the issuer. If no object is made to the custodianship petition, the court will almost always approve the petition at the custodianship hearing. This officially puts the custodian in control of the shell, where they become granted. After that, the court process mainly just involves a status report that then eventually, if the court is satisfied with how things are going under the control of the custodian, a motion is made to discharge the custodian officially completing the process, which then after the custodian is discharged, uh, that means he's done found his merger. He's done cleaned up all the shell, all, all the filings. Everything is current. looks good. He's found his merger and he can move on to the next shell. He wants to become a custodian of what happens to the shells after custodianships are granted. The job of the custodian in the view of the court is to put the interest of all the existing shareholders first, but that almost never ends up being the case. Just about a hundred percent of the time, the custodian is taking control of the abandoned shell for their own interest and not that of the existing shareholders. In some cases, the custodian will even do a reverse split, wiping out the former shareholders. That's why you've got to know the background of your custodian. Um, there's been several custodians out there that I don't follow at all. Uh, because they will literally take control of the shell for their own personal, you know, agenda. Um, they're not looking out for the shareholders or looking for the future of the thing. They're trying to do it to make money. In some cases, they will do the reverse split, wiping out the former shareholders. 
outcome. That's a bad situation to get caught in. The custodian is usually looking to sell or peddle the shell for a profit. Shells can sell from anywhere from $20,000 to $100,000 or more, while the cost of hijacking the shell usually ends up being less than $10,000. We were talking about hijacking it earlier, uh, where they make up these fake filings to make their, create their own pump and dump of sorts uh, to attract a bunch of buying attention. And of course, everybody knows these custodians can be explosive plays. So that's why they hijack them. The custodian will often take the money they spent gaining the control of the shell and bill the shareholders by putting the debt on the balance sheet as a convertible debt or note. Those notes can get then end up turning into ugly share selling schemes as we know as dilution. That also can happen with a, a bad custodian. Um, they'll do that as a way to, you know, instead of, instead of taking care of the debt before their merger, they will obviously put the debt uh, as a convertible note in the filings and then sell the shell. Um, it's a, that's an ugly way of doing it. So after, you know, the, the new merging company has come in, um, they're, you know, they're diluting it to try to pay off this note, which could be as little as $20,000 worth. It could be, you know, it depends on much debt the shell was carrying. Even without using bogus debt to create share selling scams, the shells can turn to some kind of a scam like the CYP. Uh, these other companies all ended up being suspended by the SEC. <clears throat> More often than not, though, the stocks won't get suspended and some can turn to monster plays making hundreds of percents, even thousands of percent gains, especially when they've got a good merger, you've got a good custodian to take control of this play, they're doing all the proper things, they've got a history of it, um, just like the ones here at the top that we first were mentioning, you know, Richard Chang is, on top, is, is, is spot on with his custodianships, I think MXMG was his latest one, you, you guys have been seeing that one lately pop. Uh, but his are great. David Lazar's are great. And Richard Ricaro's are great. What are some custodian plays such big movers? Stocks that end up being taken over the through the custodianship process can offer several profit opportunities for penny stock traders for a number of reasons. The share price has often fallen on light volume to relatively low prices for the same share structure of the stock due to years of inactivity, putting some of the stocks in extremely good price ranges, setting them up with the potential for large gains if interest builds for the stock. Most have seen very little trading activity for many years, so much of the float is owned by non-active traders that may not even realize the stock has become active again. This means the retail active float is often even smaller than the true float. Custodianship stocks are automatically considered reverse merger candidates. As reverse merger plays, that allows for the type of speculation that can create big message board and social media pumps. What's the best time to trade a custodianship plan? The best pro profit opportunities often come in stages, usually stretching over several months. When the custodianship petition is filed with the courts, this can often be the biggest short-term profit opportunity for custodianship play. Custodianship petitions have been done in several states in the past, Nevada, Florida, Colorado, Wisconsin, Utah, California, Texas, and North Carolina. And over the past couple of years, the overwhelming majority of custodianships have taken place in Nevada, which is NVSOS, which is, which is great since Nevada has a court website that offers the public assets to all their court filings as they are not docketed. We scan the Nevada court site at a last a couple days a day for a new custodianship petition so we can get the information to our members ahead of the pack. When a custodianship petition is granted, it can often lead to some short-term investment in the stock, both leading up to the court date for the custodianship here and often the custodianship is officially granted. As mentioned earlier, the custodianship hearing is usually scheduled for four to six weeks after that position is filed with the court. We track all the upcoming court dates for our members so they don't miss any profit opportunities. When the entity is reinstated at the Nevada SOS, it can often lead to some short-term interest in the stock again. Some custodians will reinstate the entity right after the custodianship petition is granted. Others will wait until they have found a buyer for the shell before they reinstate the entity. We track all Nevada SOS filings in real time so we can catch reinstatement filings as soon as they hit so that our members won't miss any profit opportunities. When a custodianship is discharged by the courts, meaning the court has become satisfied with the arrangement, basically completing the custodianship process, it often leads to some short-term interest in the stock, both leading up to the court date for the discharge hearing and after the discharge is officially granted. This usually happens a few weeks up to a few months after the custodianship is granted. Some custodians put their shells up for sale before completing the process so things move fast after the discharge. Others wait until after completing the custodianship process to put their shells up for sale. We track all the upcoming court dates for members so they don't miss any profit opportunities. 
when the show is sold, this is usually the other cast that creates the biggest move, okay? When it sells or gets that reverse merger, which is the biggest thing I'm waiting on PFMS. It's, it's the biggest catalyst that'll hit. Besides the custodianship petition being filed, this stage is that set off the LCTZ move, once it is known that new owners are taking over control of the shell, it becomes a full-blown reverse merger play supported by all kinds of yummy speculation that message boards and social media's pumpers just eat up. This stage usually will not happen until several months or longer after stage one, the filing custodianship petition, which in the case of PFMS, it's already been filed, it's already been granted, it's already been reinstated. All he's got to drop is these current filings with this reverse merger information. Then all of a sudden, you've got this huge, massive pump of you know due diligence players coming out and saying, oh, wow, look at this company that they're merging into it. It's got this, it's got this, it's worth this much money. It's, it's, it's massive, you know, and we're in at the bottom. Um, and it can run for several days or even weeks sometimes. Knowing that stock can have several stages of price movements, different traders will approach its custodianship play with different trading plans. Some will try to profit on as many of the stages as possible, while others will buy early and take some profits along the way, but still treat the trade as a long-term play, holding shares for that big reverse merger at the end. And that's what I'm waiting on PFS, that big reverse merger at the end. The key, as with any trade, is buying ahead of the pack, which means catching the catalyst as early as possible. Which custodianships plays are the best? Stocks that are in lower price ranges, typical under one cent share in the low paintings with relatively good share structures for the price to have the biggest potential to turn into big plays. So they usually draw the most attention. So there's ones typically under one cent a share with that very nice share structure. Uh, as we know, PFMS is well under a penny, got that very nice share structure. And it usually draws the most interest. Interest can also depend on who the custodian is for the shell as well. You know, it's a well-known custodian. That's why we follow these key custodian guys. Some custodians are more popular than others. The custodians that were involved in big movers in the past tend to get more attention when they do new custodianships. Like I said, David Lazar, Richard Chang, my two top favorites for custodians. <clears throat> so who are the custodians? We track all active custodians, so with a full list of all the players involved, including entities and attorneys used by all other custodians, you just never know one of the ter tickers might turn into a big runner propelling the custodians into ranks of the most popular as the date of this report. Most active custodians are Rhonda Kiv uh, Kivini. I don't really play hers. I've done very little of them. And David Lazar with 20 most played. And then Richard Chang. David Lazar has the most active uh, custodianship play, so I really like them. And, of course, there's Brian Glass um, and several others in here. So, you know, I've got this list for you guys to read, and you're welcome to do it. Uh, custodian plays are the type. <clears throat> but, yeah, on, the, on this group here, um, Richard Chang, Bauman, group would probably be considered the most popular, meaning that the custodian play tends to draw the most attention. Um, custodian plays, like many others, are types of penny stocks. Plays tend to run in cycles with the recent big moves made by LCTZ, CNHC, we could be entering into an exciting new cycle of hot activity for custodianship plays. It is important to be prepared. Um, so having a good scanner, watching your custodianship set, I use OTCRE um, right here under custodianship. It pops up with all the custodianships that hit daily, um, sometimes you know weekly, daily, whatever. Um, but being on top of those custodianships is always, is always awesome to be. But um, I hope this, guys, helps you out with suspensions. And, um, you know, understanding suspensions and understanding custodianship plays. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and open the mic for questions.